Be seated. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. The Lord be with you. Holy and gracious God, open our hearts and minds to your word. As we've heard these beautiful and powerful readings, stir in our own minds and hearts and bring the healing that we need. Fill us with your grace. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace is a hard thing. Grace demands total submission. Grace levels the playing field. Grace undermines our self-reliance and all of our false images of ourselves. Grace frees us and gives us life. But grace is a hard thing. We heard an account of grace just a few moments ago in the reading out of Kings this morning. We heard this story about this powerful man named Naaman. Naaman was powerful. Naaman was famous. He was a military leader of the Syrians. We call him Aram in this particular reading, but you notice he mentions Damascus. It's the area known as Syria today. He's a military leader. He had won battles, and because he won battles, he had won the favor of the king. He was powerful, folks. He had status. He would be like General Petraeus, or Colin Powell, if you will. And with his success came everything that went with it. Pride. The adulation of the people. Everyone looked up to him. And with that wealth and popularity. Yet Naaman reminds us today of ourselves. We pride ourselves on our good name, our reputation. We pride ourselves on what we have accomplished and how the world sees us. We pride ourselves on being self-sufficient and independent. Now, we may not be at the level of Naaman, but we too are like Naaman. It's a part of our sinful nature, our desire to be like God, to be in control. But when leprosy appears for Naaman, now the word there in the Hebrew indicates a skin ailment. It can be anything from a fungal infection, doesn't that sound lovely, to psoriasis or eczema or um, it could even be a bacterial infection. The word in Hebrew is also used for walls and clothing. So that's why they say a fungal infection, something that's making something dirty and not good. So when Naaman suddenly is seized with that problem, it was a life ruiner, if you will, a life destroyer. The stigma and the simple reality of being ostracized and deemed unclean, because by the way, we don't want any of that. Don't come close, because you might give it to me. Okay, if you want an idea of what this sounds like, here's a couple words that maybe will give you the reaction. Scabies, head lice, bed bugs. What comes to mind? Pretty quickly you go, oh, dirty. Folks, they are literally just insects that can be picked up just about anywhere, and it's not a matter of hygiene. But oh, the stigma. That person has bed bugs. That person has lice or whatever. This ailment had the potential of bringing down Naaman's house of cards. He had a great name. He had his fame. He had everything, and now... If he's not cured, he's got nothing because the rule was people who were lepers had to live outside of community and could not associate with their family and friends closely. 
and by no means with the king. Naaman's got a problem. Today, we have leprosies too. Ailments that diminish the body. Alzheimer's is one of those ailments. The long goodbye. Have you ever noticed when someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's how friendships start to fall farther and farther apart? The person becomes more isolated. The caregiver becomes more isolated. It's that kind of leprotic stigma. We also know that there are other things like leprosy of scandal. A scandal, just a wrong word, can bring somebody down, breaking them, humiliating them. We're watching that in our own community. We see it, we've seen bits and spurts in the paper. The word of scandal. Somebody's been removed from a position. Now, we're not privy to, nor should we be privy to all the information, but oh, our minds in the community are worrying and our tongues are wagging. It doesn't take much to recognize leprosy is not just a skin ailment anymore, but rather those things that can threaten our status and power, our reputation, life as we believe it to be best. The reality is that we are all vulnerable, like Naaman, though our leprosy might be different. The story is the human story. It is the story of self-reliance and independence, of power and how we choose to use it, the story of success in the eyes of the world, and the sham, the sham that it can be. The reality is that Naaman's life is ruined until grace appears. And there is grace. And this appearance of grace is humiliating, humbling. It takes down his pride and the arrogance and confronts the sin. On one of the raids, of the army of Aram, they grabbed people and ripped them out of their community, out of their families, out of everything that they knew, took them away and enslaved them. We so kindly put it in the Old Testament that it was a servant girl who was gathered. Read the words in the text. You can see that it doesn't sound too bad, but frankly, folks, she was enslaved, forcibly taken from her home. And she now is serving Naaman's wife. This was not the hoped for life that she had dreamt of. What of which one of us would like that very much? But here's the wildness of it all. It is through a slave that grace appears. Naaman's life is sitting in ruins if he can't get over this leprosy, and he's obviously at the end of the road. Yet a slave girl's voice says, if only, if only he would be in the land of Samaria where the man of God is. This girl, even though had been ripped out of her home, ripped away from everything that she knew, she didn't lose sight or misplace her faith in God. And here she's the one, a slave, is the one speaking the word of grace and hope to Naaman. And Naaman listens. Naaman goes to the king. The king writes a letter to the king of Israel and gives him to get safe passage. Okay, this is unusual. This is, if you will, Putin sending word to the president of Ukraine, hey, my top general's sick, and I know the hospital in your country could take care of him. Let him come and get healed. 
it's that kind of a scenario. It's outlandish. You don't go to your enemy asking to take care of your general. Yet here we go. Now, what does Naaman do? Naaman girds himself up but royal. Look at the text. He's taking his chariot. What is a chariot? It is a war vehicle. Chariots are not carriages. This is a war vehicle. This is what he would ride into battle. It's a power symbol. And then not all of the text was in our pericope today, but the chapter tells us that he also took with him 1,000 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 complete suits of clothing. So he girded himself up in his military might. He girded himself up in his wealth to take care of anything he's going to need, to get what he needs. Now there's a lot of nervousness. The king of Israel is frankly disarmed and going, whoa, what is this? He's baiting me. This, the other king is baiting me. We're going to go to war. He tears his clothes. But then the man of God says, no, don't worry about it. Send him over. So Naaman shows up. Think, if you will, of a motorcade showing up in front of the church. Motorcade of Lincolns and all kinds of the highest-end vehicles with all kinds of power and wealth. Or Ferraris, as they're in the, on the island this weekend. And Elisha didn't pay him any attention. He just sent word out, have him go wash seven times down the Jordan. He'll be clean. Naaman is infuriated. I deserve better treatment than that. Does he not know who I am? Does he not know of my military might and prowess? Does he not know of my friendship with the king? Does he not know how much wealth I have? Does he not know who I am? Can you just hear the argument going on? He's disgusted. And he's saying, gosh, the rivers back home are better than this. You know, the Jordan is not much of a river. And then grace appears again with a servant. Servants are not powerful. Servants don't have a lot of voice. Servants don't have any wealth. They are servants. Yet here we go. The servant says, but master... <laughs> If he had asked you to do something hard, would you have done it? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Naaman finally goes and washes and is made clean. People of God, this story is a story of grace, of grace that pursues Naaman, grace that is after Naaman to not allow him to stay in his false reality but to give him that true reality of who he is, that he is a person loved by God. Naaman leaves the waters clean, but he also leaves the water converted. He returns back to Elisha, and he's saying, your God is the only God in all the earth. He becomes a follower of Yahweh. He becomes a follower of God. He even then will take soil, two mule loads of soil, back to his homeland so he can worship God on the soil of Israel. It's a story about grace breaking in to someone's heart who wasn't necessarily wanting it. And ladies and gentlemen, it is the story of God's grace that meets us in the waters of baptism. God draws us to the waters of baptism, infused with the word of God, the promise of Christ, saying, you are my child. You are a sinner, but I love you and see past that. I see beyond that to who you really are. And my son has died for you and been raised for you. In the waters of baptism, we are washed and made clean. We are filled with grace upon grace. 
and stepping out of those waters, we too are converted. Be that if you are baptized as an infant or as an adult, and as often as we remember our baptism, we return to those waters. It is a matter of us coming out renewed in who we really are and letting go of our sinful nature, letting go of our false ideas, letting go of our having to be in control and putting on the way of Christ, the way of love and mercy and compassion compassion and love that stir up that as we in our servant roles in life speak up the word of grace to others that God chooses to use you and me to pour grace into a world that hurts too much brothers and sisters grace can be messy it wasn't a simple story for Naaman. It's amazing how much space it actually took to tell this story. In a matter of not too many words, it's a powerful story of what God is up to and what God is still up to. As we gather around word and sacrament, we are gathered around God's grace. And God is still working inviting us, calling us into this way of life, calling us to let go, calling us to give up control, calling us to humble ourselves, get over ourselves, and be who God's formed us to be. Grace means letting go of our pride and power. In 1 Chronicles 21, King David is confronted by Gad because he had done something wrong in God's sight. And David responds, I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great but let me not fall into human hands. David humbled himself, falling into the mercies of God, letting go and letting God take control. Grace can be hard for us, yet it's what gives us life, gives us hope. How are you struggling with grace in your life? You know, those quiet thoughts with which you struggle and often don't share. How are you struggling with grace? Where is God prodding you and calling you to grace? Who are you called to share grace with? This is not a spectator sport. Church is all hands on deck. We gather here around word and sacrament are sent back out into the world to share grace. Who is God calling you to share grace with? And what is it that God wants you to let go of? Amen.